So as we sort of wind up uh, this, this, what we've been doing, we're going to end at the end. We're going to end at the final word. When you hear the phrase final word, what do you think of? Amen. What? The argument is over. The is over. <laughs> yeah, the final word. Now, sometimes the final word is something like this. Are you ready? Isn't that sometimes the final word? You just turn and walk away. You've had it. Have you ever been hung up on? That's the final word, right? I've, somebody called me this week, and I'm just <coughs> talking away. And for some, I don't know what's wrong with these people. How could they not agree with me? How could they not think I've got all the wisdom of Solomon? And they said, they just hung up. They just went click. And there are other people who have had these famous last words as they die. And here are just a few of them. Uh, a playwright said, why should I talk to you? I've just been talking to your boss. Or how about Humphrey Bogart who said, I should have never switched from scotch to martini. <laughs> or how about this one? I have offended God and mankind because my work didn't reach the quality it should have. Leonardo, really Leonardo? And I don't mean DiCaprio. You know, think about this. What's his most famous painting? The Mona Lisa. Guess what? It's not finished. He, he never finished it. He was still tinkering with it. And when it, when he, when it left his hands. Or how about Buddha, who said, work hard to gain your own salvation. Or Steve Jobs, as he's dying, says, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. But perhaps my favorite, uh, one of my favorite people from the uh, prior century uh, was Winston Churchill, who on his deathbed, the last words he said was, I'm bored with it all. Really? He defeated Hitler. But he's bored with it all. But one of the questions that comes up is, why is life so hard? Have you ever asked that question? Or has somebody come to you and said, why is life so hard? Is that, an, is that a question that people today say? Why do they say that? A test? Okay, why else might they say it? Okay, thank you. How else? What else might people have a reason for saying life is so hard? Because it is. Because it is. It am what it is, as we would say from Baltimore. It am what it is. You know, life is so hard. And... For people who happen to be in a building like this, and what are we in? A church. You know, sometimes even people who come to church, they come to complain to God. Have you ever met any of those people? People who come to, come to church in order to put in their list. It's like you go to the deli counter, right? And what do you do? You put in your order, right? What do you say? Last time I went, I said I want a third of a pound of corned beef sliced thin. That's what I said. And it was a little bit more, and I said, no, that's fine. But don't we do the same thing with God? Don't we put our order into God and say, God, here's my deli order. I want a whole pound of roast beef, but I want my roast beef rare. I like the rare. And so, and I want this much, I want it sliced like this. Or God, I want a life that looks like this because I think I deserve it. I mean, look at me. Look at what I'm doing for you. I'm your assistant. Don't I deserve better? But the people who were received the book of Hebrews, they were in a time and a place just like us. When you think about our country and what's all around us, what is it like out there? Are people friends of Christians? No. Is it a Christian nation? No. And so the early church was 
planted not in a place where everybody's going to say, oh, we like Christians. Oh, let's pat them on the back. We like all these religions, don't we? I mean, Rome's got 10,000 religions. What's one more? Let's celebrate. No, they hated it. And they were put into this place. And they were told that they were going to have a life that had the T word, trouble. And so the writer of the book of Hebrews starts out, what do you say to people who are under attack? What do you say to people who are under the gun? And the writer writes out, it starts out, he says, he doesn't say it's going to get better. Does he say, no, he says what? In the past, what happened? God spoke. God spoke uh, to our ancestors through prophets at many times and in various ways. He starts out by saying, you know what? You're not alone. And God has spoken. And since God has spoken, everything's going to be okay. God has spoken. He hasn't left you. He hasn't abandoned you. It says he spoke through prophets. These are, who are prophets? When I pause, that's when you talk, by the way. <laughs> Messengers of God. Prophets are God's mouthpiece. Okay, they speak for God. It's not their words. They got the message. It's like an actor in a play. They get the words, and what does the actor do? Says it. And if they don't, the di they're fired. The director says, no, 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 no. That's what they have, you know, uh, that's why the actors are on strike now. No, that's not right. It's for a different reason. He says, in many times and in various ways. Have you ever seen a piece of work? There are different kinds of artwork, right? There's painting. There's all sculpture. You know, there's all sorts of stuff. Have you ever seen a mosaic? Do you know what a mosaic is? What's a mosaic? A lot of little pieces, tiles, a lot of colors. When it says here, when we're being told various ways, God in the past didn't go up in the sky and just say, this is it, one time. No, all these little pieces. If you ever go to the Orlando airport, and happen to choose Southwest. Okay, you take the tr you go through security, which is a which is a joy, by the way. You know, you go through the scanner, and because I got artificial hips, I don't go through the normal scanner. I go through the <laughs> scanner. You know that thing because I got all this metal, and they think I got a gun. So anyway, you go through the joy of standing in line. You get scanned, and they go through your underwear and your in your suitcase. And you come out, and then you get on the tram, right? And when you get out on the tram, what happens? There is a mosaic right there. It's right there in the middle, this big mosaic. And then you got to go down to the right or the left. And when you go down to the right or the left, guess what's on the floor? You'll never guess what's on the floor. A mosaic. You guys are brilliant. It's another mosaic. It's all these little pieces. You go to Italy, I remember we went, we were uh, in Florence, and we went into this church, and we looked up, and there's this beautiful image. And I thought, well, you got to be nuts to paint on your back, you know, like this. They didn't paint it. It was a mosaic, all these little tiles put in, stuff is like, I can't draw a straight line with a laser, and these people can do this, it's amazing. But God spoke in like mosaics, all these little pieces that fit together. Now, does one little piece tell the story? No. How's the story told? How is the image made? All the pieces fitting together, they portray a bigger picture. And that's how God spoke in these various ways. And in the past, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. In the past, we had this mosaic. We had all this, these little pieces. But now, how is God going to, how did God speak? By his son. 
And when he spoke by his son, he spoke in the same way that you act when you see a cockroach. What do you do when you see a cockroach? You, st you scream. Yeah, we get the screaming part. I get that. But how do you attack the cockroach? Do you, do, you, do you get there with a little stick and say, okay, little boy, let's go out, and you guide him out? Is that what you do? What do you do? Stomp on him, Stomp on him right? When God sent Jesus, God stomped and said, this is it. No more. He is the last one. He has spoken to us. He has spoken. It's done. God's speaking is over as we would say in Baltimore. It's over, you know, by his son, who he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made what? The universe. What prophet ever, 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 ever was part of creation? None of them. God speaks now through his son, and what did his son where was his son? He was there before there was anything. Before the creation, before the Big Bang, or whatever else you want to call it, Jesus was there. You know, uh, the prophets, think about the prophets. Did, when the prophets spoke, whose words did they say? God's. And remember what was the phrase they always used? Thus say the Lord, right? They say, Thus saith the Lord. Do they say, now I'm a prophet, let me tell you, Bubba. No, they, they quoted God, right? They quoted God. When Jesus spoke, tell me how many times he said, thus saith the Lord. You're absolutely right. He never said it. He never said, thus saith the Lord. But what did he say? He said, you have heard it said, but... I tell you, he's saying, I am God, and I'm just as I'm giving you God's word without somebody in the middle. You know, you get a card that's delivered to the post office, it's one thing. You get a card that's hand-delivered, that's even better. I, I, I buy cards for Marianne, and because I'm extravagant, I look at the 97-cent ones at Walmart, uh, but we sort of have a tradition in our house. You don't just put a card and just sign your name. No. On the front of the card, you write to, and you put that person's name. Or I write, my dearest Marianne, on the front of the card. I haven't opened the card yet. And then you open the card, and then on the right, there's usually the, you know, the words, there's a picture of a kitty cat or something, I don't know. And so, but we don't just put our name. We put, again, at the top, we personalize it. And then there's a little uh, space to write something, why I'm doing this. And then it's with loving affection, your idiot husband. <laughs> Me, check. When God spoke, through his son, that was it. It's a very, very, very personal expression. Jesus never said, thus said the Lord. He said, I'm the one. And when he said that, he said, I'm the same as God. I'm equal to God. And he was made the universe. And this, uh, and it's this, he has given us his message. And when God gives his message, guess what? That's it. And we hear this in Jude. He says, Beloved, although I am very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to do what? To contend for the faith that was what? Once and for all delivered to the saints. It's over. Now, I know you get these people who come to your door and they knock on your door, and they want to come in, and they want to talk to you. Sometimes they're, you know, uh, clean-cut young men in white shirts and narrow black ties, and they ride bicycles. And then there are other people who come, and they have a different 
uh, flavor of the Bible. And both of them basically say the same thing. Jesus was all right. You know, what the Doobie Brothers say. You know, Jesus was just all right. But we don't know it got lost. So we're going to restore it. Aren't we good? Aren't you lucky that we're bringing to you the restored truth? No. It was once and for all delivered. That's it. His final word is Jesus, period. And who is this Jesus? He is the final word. He is the what? <coughs> he is the radiance. The radiance. What's radiance? Shiny, brightness. I went this week. I'm going to have cataract surgery uh, on August 1st for this eye because it's the worst one. I'm not sure that's the way to go, but that's what they said. And anyway, guess what they did when I went in to see them? They put drops in my eye, right? They die. I look like a drug addict. I mean, you know, the pupils of my eyes are like saucers, right? And you don't walk outside in the, in the Florida sun. Why not? Bright. Right. So I had these sunglasses. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. Now, some of you may have uh, some history with reading your Bible. Remember, Israel is enslaved in Egypt, right? They then have the Passover, and they get out, right? And then, they, and then God leads them into a cul-de-sac. Did you know that? That's, you know what a cul-de-sac is? It's a road where there ain't no way out, baby. God leads them to a cul-de-sac in front of the Red Sea. You ought to read that because it says, I led them there. There was no mistake. It isn't that they got lost. It isn't that their phone lost their GPS signal and Moses is going around like this. Where do we go? No, God led them to this place. And where was, does anybody, for $20, for $20, does anybody know the name of the place? called Baal Zephon. Baal Zephon, the god of hidden treasure. He led them to this place, to Baal Zephon, and there's no way out. And guess what? The Egyptians, what do they do? They have a party. They say, they're leading, let's go get them, right? We're going to do what to them? Kill them, eradicate an early Nazi. And what does God do? Does God sit back and say, oh, well? No, what does God send? He sends a pillar that stands between the Egyptians and the Israelites. And it's a pillar of fire. It's a pillar that glows in the day and is a pillar of fire at night. When they build the tabernacle, God's spirit descends on it so that no one can stand it. When they open up the Temple of Solomon, God's Spirit lights the place up. What is that? The radiance of God's glory. If Maybe if you've been in church for a while, you've heard it referred to as the Shekinah glory. You ever hear that phrase? It's the Shekinah glory. It is the brightness of God, God appearing in a way that we can see, but it just shadows you and me. He, he is the radiance. He is the exact representation. Have you ever had your fingerprints taken? Why? Don't ask me. <laughs> and when they do the fingerprint, what are they hoping for? An exact representation. When there used to be a thing when you wrote a letter, letters didn't always have that delicious tasting gum on them, you know, that you lick the glue. Doesn't it taste great? You know, it's fabulous. And it slices, oh, it slices. Obviously. Anyway, the, 
they, it, paper didn't always have that. So how did they seal those envelopes? You remember? Wax, right. They put some hot wax on there, and then what did they do? They put a stamp. They put an imprint. It's call, it was called a signet. It was on a ring. It was a signet ring. It had the exact character of the ring went into the wax. And this is what they're saying about Jesus. Jesus has the exact character of God. He is the imprint of him. He is the exact representation of his being. There's no looking at Jesus and saying, well, I like Jesus, but you know, there's part of this I don't like. You know, you can't do that because you got all of God. And you got to take all of God or you take none of him. Now, I know that's not very American, is it? Because we like choice. Don't we like choice? You like choice? Option. Ooh, I love that word, option. Think about this. When you go to the grocery store, how many different kinds of potato chips do you are there? Just <laughs> tell me. Too many. But it's not just potato chips, right? It's potato chips that have sprayed on them. And I always wonder what those chemicals are. You know, the barbecue chips, you know, the sour, sour cream and chives. Ugh. Anyway, you got, and they got different thicknesses, right? And you got malt vinegar chips, right? And you got chips from Hawaii. And you got chips that are made for dipping, right? And it goes on and on and on. But he is the exact representation. There is no choice. You either take God as all of him or none of him. There is no choosing. We don't get those choice. He is God, and he sustains all things. Jesus is the one who's holding the universe together. Galatians says, he is before all things, and in him what? All things fly apart. All things hold together. Remember what George talked about, our circumstances? You heard that? Think about this. Howard Hendricks once said, somebody came up to him and said, oh, Professor Hendricks, you don't know the circumstances I'm under. Do you know what he said in response? What are you doing under those? What are you doing under your circumstances? God says, I am with you no matter what, and he holds it all together. If Jesus is God, he's holding it all together. You may think it's all coming apart. You ever been there? You ever been in that part of your life you thought it is things are just flying apart? God says, I am there and I'm holding them together. They were connected and I'm still there and I'm still standing and we can trust in him. And the writer of Hebrews goes on. He says, because of all this good stuff, what? What do we got to do? Pay the most careful attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. When you, how do you pay careful or close attention to something? How do you do that? Give it your full attention. What else? Don't be distracted. How about, okay, I'm paying attention to it, but yeah, that was nice. No, you stay at the task. You stay looking at it. You actually have to have an I focus, focus, a better word than I was going to use. I was going to use the word obsession. A good, there's such a thing as a good obsession. There really is that says, I'm going to be totally focused, paying everything focused, to be actively looking and working and staying with it. And what's the result if we don't? What does it say we're going to do? Drift away. Has anybody ever driven a boat? I don't know if that's the right thing, piloted a boat. You ever driven a boat? You ever driven a boat? Now, have you driven boats on... Uh, a lake. 
Okay. Anybody ever drive a boat in the ocean? Or where there's, you know, there's a, there's a tide, right? We had a boat. We had, my dad had a series of boats. And we had a, we had a, you know, there was a pier and there was what they called a slip. The slip is where the, where you park the boat, okay? And my dad rigged it up so that we had to back in, okay? Some of the people who, who drive here and they back into their parking spaces, you all know what it's like. But it's different with a boat, isn't it? Why is it different? There's no break. What? The motion of the water, the tide is pulling you and the wind. You can get yourself all lined up. And I was in the front to hook it up, my dad, and we're drifting in because of the tide and the air. And if you don't get it right, guess what you got to do? Do it over. Pull out. Go back. No, there you go. No break. No break. He is, and that's what will happen to us. If we are not focused, and I'm going to use the O word, obsession, if we're not totally driven in our mind, will, and emotions toward who God is, we all's going to drift. And the drift, when you drift back in a boat, you can hit the pole, you might hit another boat. But when you drift in life, you can really have a bad accident. You can really have a bad accident. Which brings the question of how much attention are we paying? Are we paying attention every day? Are we giving him opportunities to guide us, or are we just out there drifting? He go, Hebrews goes on to say, how shall we escape if we ignore this average salvation? This great, great, great salvation. How if we ignore it? You know, it's not just another kind of salvation. This is it, boys and girls. This is it. Because as we've said before, there's basically Christianity, which says we are saved by grace through faith. God did it all. He did it all. He came. He died. He paid. And now we receive. And because of who he is and what he's done, we receive and we want to live in response lovingly in response to him. Everything else, all other religions, faith systems say, okay, it's up to you, right? You better get in line. You better do this. You know, you got to do this. Here's the checklist. And then, if you're nice, maybe God will pay attention. You see the difference? Christianity, Jesus, is so unique. And you can't just put Jesus on a shelf. He doesn't allow us to do that. Think about the what are some of the things he said about himself. I am with you always. Buddha never said that. Confucius never said that. What is the, something else that Jesus said? <coughs> I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's it. I am it. What else did he say? Lean on me and not on your own understanding. How about this one? This isn't, I love this. This is just an offhand comment. You know, it's not in front of a big crowd. You know, he has sent his disciples out to heal, to preach, and throw out demons, right? And they got, those guys come back, they're all geeked up. You know, they are just excited. Jesus, guess what? It all happened just like he said. And the demons even went out. Jesus makes this offhand comment. He says, you know, before there was a physical universe, before there was anything, I saw Satan fall. Think about that. He's saying, I'm from eternity past, and I was there when Satan fell off the wagon and sinned. He saw that. Before Abraham was, I am. 
Now, you you got to be, you can't just take a little bit of this stuff. You can't just take a little bit of Jesus. You got to take it all or nothing. N.T. Wright put it this way. He said, how can you live with the terrifying thought that the hurricane has become human, that fire has become flesh, that life itself became life and walked in in our midst? Christianity either means that or it means nothing. It's a light switch. You either buy it all or none of it. Jesus is not like a dimmer switch. You get anybody got dimmer switches at home on the lights? You know, they go up a little bit. And you can, no. It's on or off. You're in or you're out. T.S. Lewis put it like this in Mere Christianity. I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing. Foolish thing, remember that. That people often say about him, Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher but I don't accept his claim to be God. This is one thing we must not say. A man who merely is a man and says the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a pope's aide, or else he's the devil of hell. He goes on, he says, you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend it. Jesus is who he says he is, Somebody uh, summarized this quote by saying, Jesus is either uh, a lunatic, a liar, or he's the Lord. Those are your options. Who is your Jesus? Who is the Jesus of your neighbor? Michael Card, when he wrote a song, put it like this. He said, you and me, we use so many clumsy words. The noise of what we often say is not worth being heard. When the Father's wisdom wanted to communicate he, his love, he spoke it, how? In one final perfect word. He spoke the incarnation, and then so was born the Son. His final word was Jesus. He needed no other one. Spoke flesh and blood so he could bleed and make a way divine. And so was born the baby who would die to make it mine. Because I like you guys, I didn't sing it. <laughs> the doors would have flown open. But think about it. His final word was Jesus. God didn't need anything else. That was it. His final word was Jesus. And how did Jesus come? As a baby. Dan, would you get the front light, please? Thank you. Jesus came just like you and me. Thank you. Unremarkable. His birth was unremarkable. Here's a scene from The Chosen when Mary is sitting around a fire retelling the birth of Jesus. When Joseph handed him to me, it was like nothing I expected. It was like everything I'd heard about having a baby, but I thought this would be completely different. What do you mean? I had to clean him off. He was covered in... Um... I will be polite. <laughs> he needed to be cleaned. And he was cold, and he was crying, and he needed my help, my help, a teenager from Nazareth. Jesus was born.
born just like every other baby. He needed to be cleaned up. He was cold. He's just like you and me in that regard. Don't we need to be cleaned up? Don't we get cold? Or in this weather, don't we just get incredibly hot? It just drains us. He says, he is our great high priest. And he knows personally what life on this crappy little planet is like. And he went through it all, but without sin. Without sin. He never changed the way that we can, the way that we choose. So like what George was saying earlier, you know, today becomes the day of choice. You know, this past week was Prime Week. You know, do you know what I mean by Prime Week? Amazon, right? What do you get? You get great deals, right? It's the Prime Day. They make all these advertisements, all this stuff. But that's not God's Prime Day. God's Prime Day is from 1 Corinthians 6. For he says, in the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. He's saying right here, right now. This was written to Corinthians. Back in that day, well, let me think about it this way. Think about it this way. Don't say the word, okay? But if you saw someone who had just made all the wrong decisions. Somebody who was living uh, in sin, making all the wrong choices morally, who was just going from one thing to another. Back in those days, they had a word for that. They had a, ro- had a word for that. They were called to, they were called to be Corinthianized. Because that town, that city, anything went. At night, a thousand prostitutes came down from one of the temples to ply their wares in the city. And yet God says to them through Paul, now is the day of sinners. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day. And you see, you've got to pick Jesus Totally or not at all. That's, that's really, you don't have the luxury or the option of something else because intimacy only comes when you say the one and only. You know, you hear people talk about that, you know, this man and woman have an open marriage or an open relationship. You've heard that? You know, that they, they're free to uh, have sexual relations with whoever they want at any time they want outside of the commitment of their marriage. In the words of Colonel Sherman Potter from MASH, what a lot of horse hocking. No, intimacy comes when you say you're the one. Intimacy says, this is it. He says, and intimacy with God comes when we say you're the one. I know there are many here you've been, you've been de- some of you have been deeply hurt. Some of you have been walked out on. Some of you have been wounded in ways that I'll never understand. Some people, I have a friend who lives in another part of the country, gave his heart and soul and everything he had. discover what he had been thinking. No more one and only. It has crushed him. It crushed him. There is only one. No choice. And that's the same with God. It's the same with God. We either say, I'm with you or I'm against you. Isn't that what Jesus said? Those who are for me or against me. There's no middle ground. That's it. You know. Yep. 
That's right. Roman, uh, excuse me, uh, Revelation 2. Yes, same thing. Same exact thing. But my question is, how are we trying to control God? How? Because we're trying to manipulate God to say, now God, you can, you're okay over here in my spiritual side, but this side over here, you know, this is my side, this is my thing. You don't, you don't, you know, this is me. I get to pull the lever here. I don't know if anybody here saw, you're, none of you here are old enough to remember the original version of The Stepford Wives, but there was a remake, I think it was in 2004, and when they did, they put chips in the brains of their wives. And these chips were to say, you're just going to go in the kitchen and you're just going to do anything and everything that your husband says. Yes, Stepford Wives. Have we tried to put a chip into who God is? To try to control him? To say, God, you can, you can, this is your part of my life, but you know, this other part, no, 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 no. No, he wants it all. He wants us to take him all, all or nothing. That's the way it is. And which brings up a really convicting question to me, which is some people say, you know what, the Bible, eh, the Bible's got some really good stuff. You hear this, you ever hear people say this? You know, the Bible's got some really good stuff, but it's got this other stuff. You know, we're smarter now. You, you know, we, we, don't, we don't need it. Can I ask you a question? Anyone at any point in time has to be willing to listen to change. And I don't care what it is. You go home, you watch golf. Right? Who swings the golf club? One guy, right? But guess what? There's a whole team behind him. There's a swing coach. There's a putter coach. There is a, a, a health uh, fitness guy. There's a nutritionalist. There is a sports psychologist. When the quarterback drops back to throw the ball, who's throwing the ball? The quarterback. Now, how did he get there? He had coaches, right, te teaching him, saying, don't throw the ball like that. Throw the ball like this, right? No matter who you are, no matter what you do, you've got to listen to other people. God says, you want to learn about me, you've got to listen to me. You can't figure it out on your own. You've got to be willing to accept what God says and change. Or we can try to put a microchip in God's brain and say, let me control you. Let me update your software. Don't you hate that? You're using an app on your phone, and it says, hey, we got an update. Yeah? Oh, I hate that. I'm trying to order coffee and Dunkin' Donuts, so you got to update the app. It's like, no, I just want coffee. No. You can't put a microchip it's all or nothing. We can't control him, which means we got to accept stuff that is uncomfortable, right? Not easy. C.S. Lewis put it another place like this. He says, Jesus says, give me all of you. I don't want so much of you, of your time, and so much of your talent and money, and so much of your work. I want you, what? All, all of you, I have not come to torment or frustrate the natural man or woman, but to kill it. No half measures will do. I don't want to only prune a branch here or there. Rather, I want the whole tree out. Hand it over to me, the whole outfit, all of your desires, all of what you want and wishes, your wants and wishes, and dreams. Turn them all over to me. Give yourself to me, and I will make you a new self in my image. Give me yourself, and in exchange, I will give you myself. My will shall become your will. My heart shall become your heart. 
Those are hard words to hear. But that's the deal. That's the deal. All, all of them. What, there's an old hymn, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I give. But we don't want that. We want, Jesus, I want you for everything except. And then we have our except in there, right? We, we all got an except in there. But Jesus says no. When he says come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, does he say, you give us rest, but he says, when we come, do we come with everything? We got to come with everything. You can't leave part. You can't leave part of yourself behind when you come. When you come, you come. And Jesus is saying, "Come." He's calling to you and me, "Come." And if you think I've got this wired so that I know how to do this all the time, I got some swamp land I want to sell to you, because I don't. I'm just like you. But I want to encourage all of us, encourage myself, to give him everything this week, starting today. You know what? There's this thing. There's this fear I have. I'm going to let go of it. God, you take care of it. And when it comes back like a roaring lion, I say, Jesus, you take care of it. When this uncertainty, when the news that comes that has just turned your world upside down, say, Jesus, I give it to you. And you're going to want to grab it back. I give it to you. Give me all, all. Let us be people who do it all for him. Give it all to him. Would you pray? Our Father and our God, I, I'm just so grateful, grateful that you would come in Jesus and die for us so that we could give you all of us, that you could save all of us, that you could be in the business of redeeming all of us. You knew everything about me, and yet you still died for me, and you still said, come. And we'll be eternally grateful for that. And now, God, let us go from this place being committed for you, allowing you to guide us to have all of us.